Hey all, Siege here, and today, well today's video is part one of a longer set of theories I want to put forward, all based upon a singular concept, namely that there is a force controlling or if nothing else influencing both sides of the conflict between the Sentients and the Tenno and their allies. First part of this theory has to do with Vallis, an interesting figure that essentially sprung up from nowhere during the apostasy prologue after most had assumed him to be dead. Now, like most of these theory videos, story spoilers for most of Warframe's narrative quests will be present, so you know the drill. Today's video will center around a specific idea. I don't think this is Ballas, or if nothing else, I don't think this is just Ballas. Let me explain why. Ballas' behavior is odd, to say the least. We know he was a former executor of the Seven Emperors of the Orican, and upon being forced to try his own lover Margulis for treason under the penalty of death, he secretly plotted the Orican's demise by offering information of the Tenno's whereabouts within the Void, covertly housed within the remains of Lua, or the Moon to be more precise. During the sacrifice quest, we learned that Umbra had unearthed this plot, but Ballas was a step ahead of him and by using the infested Hellman strain, was able to turn the Dax warrior he once was into the Warframe we see today effectively stopping Ballas from being revealed as a traitor. How did he get this information, though? Was he in league with Nata? Remember, it wasn't Margulis who hid the moon. It was Nata, and as Alad V said, most thought the moon had been destroyed. At no point is it shown that Nata and Ballas formed any kind of alliance, and even in the apostasy prologue, he appears to regard the Lotus as Margulis versus the actual person she is, the daughter of Hunhao, to which she herself admits to. The fact that she retains the visage of Margulis when in the company of the Sentients during the New War Prologue trilogy may even insinuate that either the Lotus is an amalgamation of Nata and Margulis, or she is Nata, mimicking the appearance of Margulis. But it's interesting to note that other amalgams seen in-game appear to take on the persona of the Sentient versus the human it's been fused with making Nata's situation unique. Even Alad's amalgams are really sentient, as they, through the shedding of parts from the Ropololist, are created by fusing said parts with Corpus Crewmen, and the sentients specifically keep the Ropololist on Jupiter in order to make sure Alad holds true to their alliance. So, where was Ballas during the events leading up to the Second Dream? From what we've seen in-game, he was effectively gone for years without explanation. Well, until the Apostasy Prologue, at least. And there's an inconsistency in his appearance that always bugged me, that being how Ballas' eyes change. When he first reappears during the Apostasy Prologue, his eyes are pure white, and I feel are pretty consistent with the images we were given of him in the past. But of course you are, imprisoned, just as she was. After this quest, there are times when those eyes shift to a different color and his speech changes as well. Think you'll move in the old senses. I'd originally thought that this was Hunhao potentially joined with Ballas due to the change in his voice, acting as a potential surrogate body to inhabit, or that this was done to suggest Ballas' voice was only being heard in the mind of Umbra, as his lips don't move and Isa clearly cannot hear what's being said at that point. However, the dialogue in Albert and Trotty's story regarding the beginnings of the Orican's Void connection have me thinking a bit differently. Here is a specific passage I'm referring to. I had failed again. I heard a crunch alongside me. Someone stepping through the shattered glass. With great shame, I gasped and rose my head to face my daughter above me. But as I opened my eyes, it wasn't her. It was me. I was alone, but not. For I stood there confronted by myself. A twin, but no brother. A reflection, but with dimension. Behind him, no horizon but a vast broiling sea of caustic light pierced at random by black pin stars. And closer, around me, a gale of flowing vapor, profane in color, billowing relentlessly into the nascent lack, seeking all directions. I was standing on a precipice of familiar stone, jagged and unanchored as though cleaved directly from the very floor of my laboratory. I wondered at the vapor's path, smoking outward more, leaving behind now the walls, the filigree gold, the rare cuts of marble from my home. I knew at once the vapor's source. I turned away, 
Back toward the wall, the trapezoid I had yawed into it. Vapor erupted inward at the gap, but not just from there. For as I rolled my eyes back, I saw the same. A great steam of scintillation smoking out from my skull. Dumb in awe, I faced toward my chimerical twin. He spoke. Little Bengal. The other me reached out, offering his hand, gliding toward me without moving, as though the distance between us was now collapsing. A confusion most euphoric filled my mind. But I sensed the other there, at the wall's breach behind me, reaching still. I screamed, but my voice was gone. Forever. I looked, but my eyes would never see again. I swept my fist across the floor, snatching broken shards, and in gripping tightly, I filled my hands with ink. Close it, I wrote. Time, to us, is all but conquered. Our sacred kuva moves us on to new skin. We numb to our daily, yearly trifles, and remedy those memories that bring lasting misery. With all our misdeeds, our excess, our indignity, we are haunted by nothing. But not for me, for with each passing day, there grew within a tumorous idea. It was minute in those early days, the pale reaching digits severed on the floor, studied with reverence, with greed. And it swelled larger in the latter days, the regal domes, the rail dedications, the unholy Zaraman parade. I had put the stars within reach, but at what cost? I never spoke of him, that man trapped in the wall. And while there have been countless souls who have followed me through with their light skippers and field wave skins and varied instruments, not a single one ever saw him. Me. And so it is that I will not take the Kuva now, or ever again. This is the last skin I'm in. Because of this idea that I cannot be sure that in all that smoke commotion, in all that panic and fear, in that bending light and blinding dark, was it I who escaped? Or the other? Now we pretty much know that this is the man in the wall he's talking about. But it's the part at the end that got me thinking. If Albert Dentrotti wasn't sure it was he or his doppelganger who came back from the void, is it possible this same concept could apply to others, and instead of one or the other coming back, that perhaps they both did, inhabiting the same body? Something I think a scene in The War Within alludes to. And finally, if it can happen to them, maybe the same thing happened to Ballas? After all, his eyes do change to look, well, a lot like the Tenos when they are being controlled by the man on the wall, the instance I was referring to when they speak at the end of The War Within quest. Most associate the introduction of the man on the wall with the Chains of Harrow quest, when in truth he is obviously quite capable of manipulating the Tenno long before he was quote-unquote released from his implied prison in the Harrow Warframe. Also, Ballas' voice is augmented in a similar way to the Tenno's doppelganger voice when his eyes change, another convenient similarity. But where's all this going, you might be asking? Well... Ballas and the Man on the Wall have a knack of showing up at or roughly around the same time, something that never really occurred to me until just recently. The only quest where Ballas shows up without some kind of appearance from the Man on the Wall is the Apostasy Prologue, but I think it's possible he's even in that one too. During the Chimera Prologue, he conveniently leads the Tenno down the exact same path they were led in Apostasy, when we were shown the first instance of what could be considered the Lotus initial betrayal of the Tenno. Not to mention, the trails used to show our path are identical, only different in color. Now, I agree, this could just be DE using old assets to make the new quest, but why? Why not use the typical quest marker that just shows us roughly where the objective is? I would think that would take much less in the way of time and assets, right? And in that quest, after pitting us against multiple copies of the Lotus, which I think is important, he leads us directly to Ballas, who conveniently enough now wants to kill the Lotus after originally setting her free. 
Am I the only one to question the idea that an Orican, who is known for extending his life almost to the point of immortality through the use of Kuva, would now desire, that's right, desire to die at the hands of a Tenno, someone he only ever refers to as a devil, and Umbra, the man he turned into a Warframe to kill his own child, his perfect death as he refers to it. Why would he even assume we would take his side instead of just finishing the job right then and there? Especially considering it was he who convinced the Lotus to leave us in the first place. And why did he seem to be just fine with being an ally to the sentience before and during the entirety of the sacrifice? What happened from the time he was stabbed until now? As this is a large shift in how he was behaving. Further, if Nata is watching as he states, wouldn't she see all this? She literally calls our name out after all. If she's always watching, how is she allowing him to make a sentient killing weapon for us? Does any of this scene make any sense? You know, at first, it seemed to me like potential bad writing or plot holes, but I don't think that's the case. I think DE used our love of shiny new weapons to distract us, and I think it worked. I mean, come on. Ballas acts like he doesn't know we're there the entire time, and then at the very end literally calls straight out to us, creating the weapon he wants to give to us all the while. Just seems odd to me, but let's look at the second part of the New War trilogy, where something again very similar to what we've seen of the Man in the Wall has influence over the Tenno being shown. Again, the same eyes are present on the Tenno the Lotus is leading, along with our own who is also exhibiting that same look in the very next scene. I mentioned in a previous video that I think the case can be made that the Lotus could even be under the influence, as a red hue can be seen emanating from under her helmet, something we don't see in any other instance with her. Remember too that her voice in the second dream, but once a child like any other, what do you remember? Has now changed to resemble that doppelganger voice I mentioned earlier. On Lua, the Lotus, I, I attacked you. Does this voice happen because she's sentient now? To which I'd have to ask, when wasn't she sentient? Is that why Ballas and Era talk like this? In all fairness, I think a case can be made that the Corpus faction also have this same effect on their voices, but generally are mechanically augmented in multiple ways. Then again, given their worship of the Void, maybe a connection even exists with the Corpus. We don't know where the sentient's collective consciousness came from, but I'll get into why I think we might actually have a clue as to where that is in another video. For now though, there just seems to be far too many odd circumstances to believe Ballas is who he says he is, something I think his interaction with Era at the end of the New War trilogy strongly alludes to. Bravo to DE for hiding all this in plain sight too, as we see all these odd details with Ballas and think nothing of it. And then, who shows up seemingly without any purpose at the very end of that quest? Feeling better, kiddo? I killed him. Isa. Did you know? Is that how you remember it? Yes. Good. Did anyone else find the inclusion of the man in the wall awfully random and just out of place? Maybe it wasn't that out of place after all, especially if this person isn't Ballas, or if nothing else, isn't just Ballas. Maybe the reason why we haven't seen him in so long is that he needed help coming back. After all, we still owe the man in the wall for something. You mad at me, kiddo? Did you forget? And we've seen the effect that debt has on us. Is it that much of a stretch to think Ballas might owe the man as well, potentially for his entire existence at this point? It's tough to say for certain, but it would explain a lot in regards to how Ballas just showed up out of nowhere, his change in allegiance to the Lotus, and his seemingly odd partnership with Era. If my thinking is right, something is playing both sides in order to make certain we go to war with Natal. And in the next video, I'm gonna show you how they're doing it.
because there is something the man in the wall specifically does with all the entities he tries to manipulate. Here's a hint. Ask yourself how the man in the wall interacts with people. There is a distinct pattern. Keep your eye out for that next part. We're going to go even deeper down the rabbit hole in order to find out what's really going on here. As I've shown, there are quite a lot of moments that just don't seem to make sense. Well, not yet at least. But if I'm right, they all make sense. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed the first part of this theory. And it got you thinking about the idea that it's possible many of the main characters in the story aren't exactly who they claim to be or that potentially we're even being shown something and someone very familiar is pulling the collective strings. A puppet master of sorts, if you will, kiddo. At any rate, I hope you all have a wonderful day today, wonderful rest of your week, and I'll talk at you all in the next one. Take care, everyone. Bye.